part four reading markets in profile we're going to start where we left off chapter six let's get right into it intermediate term auctions complexity creates opportunity jim dalton it is may 2006 and events occurring in the u.s stock market have coincidentally and unexpectedly converged with the topic of this chapter we couldn't have asked for better examples than those the market is providing right now in real time. Convergence is a term we employ quite often. It comes into play when the market is transitioning from bracket to trend or from trend to bracket. Such convergence is always accompanied by increased volatility and various time frames join the fray, which often leads to the kind of price movement that garners front page news, such as Fed derails Dow record reach which recently appeared in the Wall Street Journal. Before we dissect these unfolding events, however, let us first take a closer look at the bracketing process. In order to successfully navigate intermediate term auctions, you must first understand the way they begin, develop, and end. Convergence and the bracketing process. When a trend is coming to an end, the market begins a bracketing process which is the fine tuning of value beliefs between long-term sellers and buyers. During this part process, the market auctions up and down until fairly well-defined bracket is eventually formed. From time to time, there may be slight bracket expansions upward and downward, but they generally aren't significant until they occur on increasing volume when the new trend breaks out of bracket. The difference between a bracketing market and a bracketed market is a subtle point and vital to understanding the way shifting forces influence market activity. The tendency of markets to transition from trending to bracketing recently revealed itself in the U.S. stock market. Through May 2006, the market had been in a longer-term upward trend for three years. However, figure 6.1 shows that after recording new market highs on May 5th for the S&P 500, and on May 10th for the Dow, the long-term buying auction converged with long-term, longer time frame sellers on May 11th, sending the equity markets down sharply and establishing the first leg of the new bracket. Claiming that the new bracket is being formed is actually a rather bold statement, it is, as it is too early at the time of this writing to actually confirm that a new bracket is developing. So far, we have observed only a non-linear downward auction. For this auction to develop into a traditional bracket, or consolidating market, we need to see a series of both higher and lower intermediate term auctions, a process that can expose the convictions of long-term buyers and sellers. In just a month, from the break after the contract high on May 5th to the low on June 13th, both the S&P and the Dow have fallen more than 8%, with all indices at a loss for the year. That's a significant move, the kind of move that can make or break one's hard-earned track record. What follows is a review of the process that led to this convergence, the transition from trending to bracketing that became so easily recognizable on May 11th. In addition, we provide an updated Appendix A that summarizes the market activity that occurred between the time of this review was written and the book went to press. Defining the intermediate term. Earlier we described five time frames: scalper, day trader, short-term trader, intermediate term trader, and long-term trader. We have general guidelines for each of these time frames in order to provide some comfort in forming a structure for understanding how markets operate. We said that intermediate term markets could last for months and that it isn't always the time, but rather the distance traveled that determines whether an auction is intermediate. Consider a bracket that develops over a four month period. A downward auction is met with expected responsive buying at the bracket's lower extreme. And then the market auctions higher for four consecutive weeks before reaching the bracket's opposite extreme. We describe this as an intermediate term auction or swing trade. Likewise, if the market quickly reversed after nearing the upper extreme and fell to the bottom of the bracket in just four days, this would also be considered an intermediate term auction. 
if the distance traveled, not the length of time, that determines the intermediate term classification. The price range of an intermediate term auction is generally greater from low to high than that of a short term auction. Another distinguishing feature of an intermediate term auction is that it contains several smaller well-defined balance areas which become excellent short term trading ranges. Regardless of what you ultimately decide to define either short term or intermediate term, the key is that the auction's question begins to occur within a bracketing period. Once you have identified a bracket, your trading strategy should be look for swing trades on the bracket's extreme. In such a balancing environment, you should continue to expect a series of two-way or swing auctions. It is instrumental to acknowledge that money managers who market themselves as long-term investors continually can continually advising you to stay fully invested are in fact trend traders. Failure to distinguish between trending and bracketing markets has historically been extremely costly to trend traders. When the market is trending, of course, trend traders do quite well. But when the market is bracketing, which we have estimated to be in excess of 75% of the time, trend traders often give back a healthy portion of what they made during the trend. Transition from bracket to trends. It is vital to be able to identify when a market is transitioning to a bracket and when a new trend has erupted from the balancing range. We begin, to review the pro we begin reviewing the process that marks the transition from brackets intermediate term auctions to a trends directional conviction. As you may have already surmised, this is not an exact science. A bracketed market is a market in balance. To reiterate, with a bracket, there is likely several smaller balance ranges that develop throughout the shorter term. Two-way auction process, when the smaller balance areas, which will be featured in chapter seven, begin to cluster near the extremes of the larger intermediate term bracket. This indicates that the market is coming into a tighter and tighter balance. While this isn't always the case, it is quite common for this type of clustering activity to represent the final stage of transition from bracket to trend. Figure 6.2 illustrates a tight balance range that led to an upside breakout. As general trading principle, I have found that if the balance range corresponds to your time frame, you should go with any breakout from that balance and then monitor the trade for signs of continuation. The wider the balance area from which the market transitions, the greater the number of time frames that are likely to be involved when the breakout finally occurs and the greater the odds that the ensuing move will be significant. If price is to remain contained within a bracket, we expect to see responsive action. Participants responding to the advertised opportunity to sell at the upper end of the bracket as price is above the mean and to buy at the lower end responding to price advertised below the mean. However, just the opposite happens when the market is about to transition from bracket to bull trend. Higher prices generate more upward volume, leading to an upside breakout. Likewise, in the nascent bear trend, lower prices actually attract additional selling instead of generating lower instead of generating the expected action cutting off selling, which leads to a downside breakout and trending conditions. Trending markets, at least in their early stages, demonstrate a high degree of confidence that the current price is unfair. For the seller in an uptrend and for the buyer in a downtrend, with high confidence markets, news releases that are contrary to existing trend are likely to cause only temporary setbacks, which can provide good buying opportunities if the trend is up, for example while releases that support the trend generally serve to accelerate its process. Another way to define bracketed markets is that they have absorbed and assimilated all current information and that the long-term buyers and sellers have basically arrived at an equal sense of value. The market is marking time, new, is marking time until new information arrives. Marking time, if you guys don't know, is like um, marching in place. In this state, the market closely resembles the textbook efficient market. 
It is not uncommon to see a major news announcement, such as a monthly Bureau of Labor Statistics employment report, have a significant impact on a bracketed market. While having little or no lasting impact in a trending market, a major news release is frequently the final factor that results in a transition from bracket to trend. In other words, a bracketed market is in balance, waiting for substantial substantiative new information before it begins its next major directional auction. The transition from trend to bracket. Trends end in either of two ways or a culmination of the two. A combination of the two. The first less frequent type of ending occurs when volume which is in the direction of the trend simply dries up. As is, participants that are driving directional move are all in and there is no one left to participate. The transition is relatively quiet and calm. The market just sits there, lulling market participants into a state of complacency and stasis. In figure 6.3, S&P futures traded at 1269.70, 1269.60, 1269.40, 12 and 12.69. During four out of five days, prior to the intermediate term auction changing directions. There are less than a full point separating those four highs. The buying had simply dried up and participants contributing to the downward auction or a combination of long liquidators and new shorts over the next 18 days, the market declined to 1223 and a 3.62% move. Four beginning to rally that once failed to exceed 1269 high water mark. Before the initial decline was complete, the market had dropped to a low of 11.80, a decline of 7%. The creation of excess. The creation of excess is the second and most common end to a trend. Excess occurs when the market makes a dramatic price high or low on low volume and opposing buyers or sellers react quickly and, advertise and aggressively by auctioning price in the opposite direction. This type of trend is often stormy and sudden, which results in a state of near panic as price moves quickly and it becomes increasingly difficult to make a decision that's not influenced by heightened emotion. Figure 6.4 shows both types of auction ending patterns. In the first two boxes from the left, volume simply dried up. In the next three boxes, you see the second, more violent type of transition marked by excess. Following the excess high, identified in figure 6.4, notice the creation of an extreme form of excess known as a gap. A gap in price is created when the market does not have an opportunity or time to trade at certain prices. This happens in one of two ways. When the market auctions so quickly in one direction that prices are skipped altogether, or when market activity or market participants have changed their perception of value so dramatically that they simply begin trading at a completely different price level. In figure 6.4, the S&P auction ended with an excess high, indicating that price auction so high that it was deemed unfair for the buyer. The excess gap on the following day provided further acknowledgement that prices were indeed too high. A gap at the end of the auction that occurs in the direction opposite the most recent trend signals a reorganization of beliefs. As educational psychologist Frank Barahe summarizes Thomas S. Kuhn's groundbreaking work in the structure of scientific revolutions, transition from a paradigm in crisis to a new one from which a new tradition can emerge is not a cumulative process. It is reconstruction of field from new fundamentals. It changes methods and applications. It alters the rules. In short, the laggards are finally all in, and the market moves with real conviction. An excess high and low occurs at the low at the light. An excess high or low occurs on light or low volume. Most of the investing world, however, thinks the opposite is true. For example, many investors believe that capitulation at the end of a downward auction 
when all sellers finally sell occurs on heavy volume. But this would go against all the principles we've talked about. For example, a market may experience a period of healthy volume as for the stragglers, Gladwell's late majority or laggards, get rid of their inventory. But the final prices manifest in an excess spike are not made on heavy volume. The volume most people incorrectly ascribe to capitulation is actually a result of action in the other direction. When buyers show up in force and the price spike down is quickly rejected, confusion occurs due to the fact that after the excess high or low is in place, there is often dramatic pickup in volume as part of a counter auction. The Convergence of Intellect and Emotion the most common true end to a trend, which also signals when a bracket begins, occurs as the result of both a reduction in volume in the direction of the trend and an excess high or low. The ending of the auction offers the movement of greatest opportunity as well as the moment of greatest risk. Both risk and reward are asymmetric at this pivotal point. If the trend is downward and the auction low has been established, the investor who correctly recognizes the low and buys has a low risk, high reward position. Sounds easy, but imagine the emotions that the innovators must endure when they buy against what has been universally acknowledged. As a bear trend, the market has been auctioning fairly consistently one way down for an extended period of time and thus a decision to buy utterly flies in the face of common as well as expert wisdom. It's not easy to go against the crowd. As someone once said, being a contrarian is like committing social suicide. To be a successful trader or investor, your intellect and emotion must work as a team, which is easier said than done. On a tick chart, this kind of trend end reversal looks elongated with the final price spike that is quickly rejected. If you've done your homework and recognize that this spike is on low volume, your intellect can be saying now would now would be a low risk, high reward time to buy. But when the speed of the reaction takes your breath away, your emotions won't always be in agreement. This cognitive dissonance can freeze your trigger finger while your opportunity slips away. The investor who is short in this example, for long only money manager, short would mean holding cash, or being under committed to the market, and who fails to recognize that the auction is ending, must endure high risk and low reward. The ensuing rally is often sharp and fast. If you are a large money manager and your analysis hasn't revealed the weakening auction, then one of the reversal begins, then then once the reversal begins, there is generally limited liquidity which can severely compromise your performance. Accelerate the learning process. I have always marveled at the Apollo 12 moon mission, which was reported to have landed within 15 meters of its target. I thought it was accomplished by a room full of incredibly smart people who had created an algorithm, fired the rocket into space, and waited until it landed on the moon. I was surprised to read that the mission was off course 80% of the time, which required continual course corrections. Without these on-the-fly computations, the Apollo would have been lost in space. When working with the natural sciences, there is a comfort in stability. In the the possibility of results. Both of the constants inherent in scientific inquiry. There's a genuine feeling of delight when the mind stumbles across the correct answer. The human mind is hardwired to seek concrete answers. Moreover, our tendency to acknowledge only those answers that support our presupposed beliefs, which can lead to tunnel vision, short sightedness, and ultimately plunging profits. The difference between the natural sciences and market-generated analysis is that elements we employ to conduct our analysis are constantly evolving. The only constant we have at our disposal is change. Of course, without change, there would be no opportunity, 
and so we gladly welcome change. But as a result, it takes an extraordinary amount of time and dedication to become familiar with these types of analysis we're describing in this chapter. There is no substitute for experience in any field, of course, but because of the many complexities and subtleties inherent in trading, there is no quick way to gain that essential experience. It may appear to be misleading simple to move from novice to proficient, as the ideas we're promoting in this book are not unfathomable. However, it takes an incredible, incredible amount of dedication to elevate your trading level from proficient to expert, and that's what the diff, and that's what different, and that's what differentiates the all stars from the herd. Think of the difference between an average professional basketball player and the elegance with which Michael Jordan could dominate a game. And it is well documented that Jordan trained relentlessly, studying tapes, staying late in the gym, shooting free throws after he was totally fatigued to simula simulate game scenarios. To become true, a truly skilled investor or trader, you must immerse yourself deeply in the market's auction process, experiencing a variety of similar situations until you begin to understand how the process works in real-time, present-tense perspective. If you observe only long-term markets, it will take you years before you are able before you have seen and recorded enough patterns to completely recognize transitioning activity, let alone be able to act on the information while balancing intellect and emotion. However, recall that everything we've discussed thus far is applicable to the all time frames. To accelerate the learning process, we suggest that you also study short-term markets analyzing the short time, shorter time frame balances that occur within intermediate term brackets. This will give you an increased confidence about the entire auction process, as well as further insight into auctions that, and motivations or into, into the actions and motivations of the various time frames. The prelude to, this, to a sea of change. Having examined how trends begin and end, Let's now look at the securities market of the as they converged with our writing markets and profile in May 2006, when the U.S. equity market was entering its fourth year and an extended long-term uptrend. After the markets closed on Friday, May 5th, I commented to a longtime friend and a Chicago-based trader, William Kennedy, that everything we look at to analyze auction strength and confidence was leading me to assess the risk. From the long side of the market and being as being very high. The upward auction, despite accompanying higher price movement, was accompanied by continually decreasing volume, and the volume was not well distributed throughout the market profile. As a result, I had refused to trade from the long side for the previous two weeks. Additionally, I commented to Bill that trading from the short side was also risky and there had been no sign of sellers, only marginal buying activity. The greatest point of market opportunity is when you feel alone. Given the high risk of being outright long and the fact that longer time frame sellers had yet to surface, I purchased out of the money puts with extended time, feeling that the market would at least have to auction lower to determine if buyers remain present under current price levels. Remember, the subtlety in what we do, we don't forecast, we assess the risk of our positions. We seek to exit positions that have above average risk and establish positions that provide favorable risk reward characteristics. Once a position is established, we then monitor monitor the process for continuation. There was no expectation that the May 2006 decline would develop as it did. An auction continues until it is completed. Let's further this discussion by reviewing a strong upward trending market 
so that we'll have something against which to compare the May auction. Figure 6.5 exhibits a pattern of strong upward trending market. Notice the market trends upward, balances, and then resumes its upward trend again and again. The stronger the trend, the greater the distance between successive balance areas. As the auction ages, the distance decreases in the late stages of the trend. Price may continue to rise, but the next balance area will often be resting at the top or within the prior lower balance area. Long-term trends often resemble stairs, which with each balancing area representing a step. Downward auctions appear as if they are descending a staircase, as you can see in the daily bar chart in figure 6.6. .6. Figure 6.5, a rising trend, reveals an ascending staircase pattern. Note that the same security displayed via a different time interval looks entirely different. That's why we suggest that you review each security you trade using monthly, weekly, and daily bars. It broadens your perspective and assists you in identifying your own time frame. As the downward auction became exhausted in figure 6.6, .6, note that the lower balance area overlaps the previous higher balance area. This doesn't mean that the downward auction is over, rather that it is late in the process and so the corresponding risk of holding short positions has increased. If you're a long-term portfolio manager at, at this late point in a downward auction, the risk of holding defensive securities or cash has risen and you want to begin to commit to new positions or add to favorable positions. Long-term returns are greatly enhanced by committing cash at lower levels as long as the auction is ending. Trends that are growing tired will begin to exhibit increased volatility without producing much further directional progress. Additionally, volume will begin to decrease and in some cases auctions that are in the direction of the trend will be accompanied by less volume than on days the market auctions against the trend. Having reviewed these two auction patterns, Let's take a look at the monthly bar chart for the S&P 500 prior to May 2006 nonlinear break. We have labeled the trend in figure 6.7 a long-term trend. However, one could easily argue that the market is continuing to consolidate or balance between the high established in March 2000 and the low created in October 2002. While the market has in fact stayed within an extremely broad bracket between March 2000 high and October 2002 low, it has steadily risen since an upside breakout in March 2003, a period exceeding three years. Do you have the patience or perspective to say, that a three-year rally is not a bull market, even though it remains contained within the longer-term bracket. The practical thing for a money manager to do is to treat it like a bull trend, because if he doesn't, he won't retain any clients. John Malden in Bullseye Investing, targeting... Sorry, there's like some truck parking in front of my house. Fuck this guy's thing. John Malden in Bullseye Investing, targeting real returns in a smoke and mirrors market, New York John Wiley and Sons 2004, tells us that it is not uncommon for markets to consolidate for years. In fact, he writes that in that the shortest period of consolidation following a bear market is eight years. We are now in year six, and when we finally break out of the March 2000 through October 2002 bracket, we would expect an extremely active market. The strategies you employ for a trend and a bracket are quite different, but there are times when the market is tricky, exhibiting elements of both. The final answer, as it were, is to remain flexible and open-minded, 
And if you want to excel as a money manager, don't be a trend trader. Stick to only hold to only long positions. There is a big difference between buying and holding and staying fully invested. The last report I saw on money managers holding revealed that the average person was held for less than a year. For the most part, it seems money managers aren't really buying and holding as much as they say as much as they are staying fully invested. While I was at UBS Financial Services, the team that researched money managers reported to me and I have monitored a rate of money manager turnover for years. And while there have been few managers that did exclusively buy and hold securities for extended periods, I have observed that this practice is certainly not the norm. In other words, being more market sensitive than dogmatic is not unheard of, which is the core of what we're trying to impart even while money managers are selling customers on the idea of buying and holding, there is more nuance to it than that. There is market awareness. If you measure the price distance from the top of the, the from the top to bottom of the trend line in the S and P 500, shown in Figure 6.7, you will notice. you will notice that the difference is approximately 5%. This distance is commonly referred to as a channel. When volatility increases, which expands the channel, it is not uncommon to see a difference of 8 to 10%. Common theory would suggest that you buy a pullback at the bottom of the channel in an upward trend and sell a rally to the top of the channel. The challenge is that if you don't hedge and instead ride out the decline to the bottom of the channel and it turns out that there is a downside breakout from there, you've already given back a gain if you had one going into the correction. Worse, if you weren't on the plus side as the decline began, it would take a strong rally just to get you back to the break even point. This is where money managers can get into big trouble. Their emotions say, I can't sell now. The market's got to turn around. But once you enter that headspace, you'll be lucky if you can keep your relative standing and your absolute performance will be shot. Now let's review the S&P 500 through a shorter term lens, a daily bar chart shown in figure 6.8. The S&P 500 futures contract broke out to the upside on November 18th, 2005 on reported volume in the Wall Street Journal of more than 2 billion shares. To provide some reference, typical daily volume during this period ranged from 1.6 to 2 billion shares. Although there were certainly a few days above and below these levels, a breakout on high volume with a close near the daily high indicated that higher prices were attracting more activity which means the auction would be expected to continue higher, which it did for three more days. The world spends a lot of time searching for easy answers, and near the end of 2005, most financial talk show guests were predicting a year-end rally, which then became the Christmas rally. This talk wasn't enough to actually empower the rally, so hints of Fed pause were thrown into the mix. Media-generated situations often set up excellent opportunities for diligent investors who can observe the proceedings objectively without getting emotionally caught up in the media-driven hype. Generated hype. Our view of figure 6.8 shows that the market first balanced above the November breakout low for approximately six weeks before staging another upside breakout. Following this new upward auction, the market's second balance was established slightly above, but still well within the first balance, an indication that the trend was aging, but not necessarily over.
On March 15th, a third upside breakout took place with resulting balancing action similar to the second balancing period, as new highs were continuing to provide comfort to investors, encouraging complacency, market-generated information, time, price, and volume, was revealing that the risk of holding long positions was increasing. For those that primarily focused on earnings, additional comfort arrived in the form of strong reports of individual company and S&P composite earnings. At the time, a prominent speaker from a money manager from a money management firm told a daily business show that if investors keep focusing on earnings, we will be all right. Based on how he addressed the commentator, he probably knew that the hype had outstripped reality, but he also understood that if he said anything clearly negative, it could hurt his business. I think he was trying to be honest in a diplomatic way, because the will of the herd is a force to be reckoned with, even when it's facing the wrong way. Opportunities, just like markets, are regulated by time. If you squander that time waiting for confirmation, the consequences can be harsh. Once the investing world recognizes that change is underway, it is usually too late for large money managers to take advantage of it, as liquidity dries up and the change becomes the norm. Hear the bells a ringing. On May 2008, 2000, or May 8, 2006, the Wall Street Journal's evening wrap quoted Merrill Lynch economist David Rosenberg, There is no question that the quarter earnings season has been superb. The article stated that the quarterly results for more than 400 companies in the Standard and Poor's 500 index are in, on an average, their per share earnings were 14% higher than the year ago, according to Thomason Financial. It is also referenced Thomason, Thomason report in that quarter was the 11th straight period of double-digit earnings growth for the S&P 500. Mr. Rosenberg, according to the journal, noted that analysts were already marking up their earnings forecast for quarters to come. Just three days later, on Thursday, May 11th, the stock market began its significant move down. The point is that while earnings are important, so is market structure. When assessing risk, unfortunately, articles about weak market structure aren't very sexy and easily dismissed as technical analysis. When we started, when we started writing this chapter in early May, we talked about the market converging. By the time we were in the editing phase, it was mid-June and the decline had continued. From the high on May 5th to the close on Tuesday, June 13th, the S&P futures contracts were off 8.18% and the Dow futures were off 8.58%. Still, the experts clung to, the former, to their former beliefs. A typical Wall Street Journal quote from a company president said he believed the Dow's pullback was only temporary and that the index would close over 12,000 by the end of the year. Isn't that comforting? Another Wall Street Journal headline read, Fed derails Dow records reach. There's always, there always has to be a scapegoat so everyone can externalize their angst and anger. After all, it would be too eccentric to blame the market's decline on weak structure. It can be said often enough, you must develop a holistic understanding based on the market's real-time structure in order to separate yourself from the pack and become truly competitive money manager. Counter Trend Actions Another sign that the upward trend has aged was provided by observing the counter trend auctions, auctions that in many cases were stronger than those that occurred within the trend. Figure 6.9 shows the final days prior to the nonlinear move that began on May 11, 2006. On Friday, May 5th, S&P futures broke out to the upside, establishing a new life of contract high. Volume on the day, on this day, was reported in the Wall Street Journal. Following the close, was a 1.6 billion shares at the low, and on the of the range we discussed earlier, if the market was attracting new buyers and had any real underlying strength, an upside breakout 
to new life of contracts highs should have exceeded the upper end of volume range. Investors often laminate that no one rings a bell at the top of the market. But in a sense, the low volume that accompanied the upside breakout was that bell. During the first three days of the following week, the S&P high was not exceeded, although the Dow did manage to barely establish a new peak. In terms of assessing the risk of holding a long position, once a market attempts and fails to auction above a bracket high, the odds are good that sellers will emerge and the auction price downward and explore the opposite end of the bracket. In other words, the odds were stacked up against those holding long positions. If you recall, at the beginning of the chapter, we made the statement that a new bracket had been formed once excess had created and the market began a nonlinear move to the downside. When an auction attempts and fails to establish value in the direction and price re-enters a previously accepted value range, the odds are good that the price will auction down and explore the opposite end of an accepted range. That's the VIB theory that we're implementing. Looking back at figure 6.9, we would define a composite bracket made up of three previous interwoven balance ranges. On May 11th, the S&P began its nonlinear descent as one of the close on June 13th, the market had already declined more than 8%. Was some of this capital destruction avoidable? We think so. While the world was talking about the Dow being only 80 points from historic highs and analysts were marking up their forecast, there were many anomalies that should have been raising questions and ringing bells. Yet it was not until after the fact that the experts appeared with answers. Some of the experts said that the drop was because the market didn't like what the new Fed chairman Ben Bernanke brought to the party. But obvious clues to the market's eroding structure had been creeping in since early December, long before the world had a look at the new chairman. In our interpretation of market-generated information, we saw continuously overlapping balance ranges, low volume, poor volume distribution among the daily profiles, and counter auctions that were at least equal to auctions with the trend. Just to mention, a few of the factors that led to our conclusion that the upward trend could not continue. Our question is this. While the talk shows were clearly providing us with a surplus of information and hype, where was the intellect? The quest to do better than normal. In The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas S. Kuhn describes major shifts in scientific theory as occurring when some new set of circumstances, an anomaly, violates normal expectations. This change is initially and fiercely resisted by those invested in what previously considered scientific fact. Malcolm Gladwell would argue that this dynamic occurs in every type of human endeavor, with the innovators first to recognize that major shift is occurring. These innovators, both scientific and financial realms, are generally rebuffed by the majority that have a literal vested interest in the status quo. But eventually, the change has taken place is recognized by everyone, even the late majority and laggards, who got on board long after there is any significant opportunity to take advantage of the change. A major shift in market sentiment that occurred in May 2006 is the prime example of such a change. The financial media, the columnist, the armchair analyst, Nearly all of them were in agreement about the fact that the market was going to rip through these historic highs. Unfortunately for them, and everyone else who got long on their advice, the market had other ideas. A new set of circumstances had developed, which were visible for those who were those who knew where how and where or when to look. The buyers were finally all in, the aforementioned capitulation. And while human nature dictates that no one ever wants to be first in on the breach, sellers did emerge and the market did a major about face. Relative return managers are often caught by moves such as the one just described. Relative return refers to how an asset class performs relative to its benchmark. 
That is because their clients, which include pension funds, endowments, foundations, and individuals, are quick to penalize managers who miss significant upward market moves. As a result, most managers attempt to stay fully invested during significant rallies such as a three-year rally preceding the break. Portfolio managers and investment firms don't just risk a little underperformance at these movements, but rather a significant decline in their business, which sometimes proves to be fatal. When money managers get bearish, stay out of the market, and miss the next leg up, their reputation, not to mention their self-confidence, gets damaged. For those that develop an understanding of market structure, which provides a strong foundation upon which to build rational decisions, some of the inherent risk risks in investing can be diminished, which could be the difference between being successful and being a footnote in the history books. Oh, the difference a few points makes. We have spent a lot of time demonstrating the difference between trending and bracketing markets. As you recall, we referred to major trends as long-term and bracketing markets as intermediate term, two distinct time frames. We have also discussed the distinction between risk and forecasting. We never know how high or low a market will go. That job is handled unexpediently unex by the auction process. But we can assess the resulting risk to existing positions. It is paramount to seek confirmation in the market's unfolding present tense structure by observing market movement and volume in relation to the mean. It is possible to monitor auctions for continuation. Days in the direction of the auction time frame you are trading should result in better volume, progressive value area migration, and the more elongated market profile shapes. To recap, if a market is trending upward and higher prices are attracting new businesses and additional volume, then the mean is continually rising. If the opposite is true, the higher prices are attracting less volume, then it becomes apparent that the mean has remained well below the current price, which means the odds are high that price will return to those levels. If you can identify when the odds are changing and then act on the knowledge, then you have a meaningful advantage over the majority of investors who will wait until proof is inconvertible before making a move. If the highly com competitive investment business, the reward, even if only a few percentage points, can be significant. Next chapter is going to be short-term trading. We're going to go ahead and pick that up tomorrow. Um, I appreciate everyone hanging out and hopefully you learned something. If you're trading today, make sure that you're managing risk and sticking to your trade plan. And I will see you guys tomorrow.